Okay, well, it's the top of the hour at 9 a.m. here in British Columbia. It is uh, noon in Ontario and one in New Brunswick and obviously all sorts of times uh, around the world, depending on where you're joining us from. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I'm the Dean of Student Success at Yorkville University and Toronto Film School. And on behalf of the Student Success Unit, I am thrilled to welcome you to today's Ask an Expert session. Our goal with these talks is to provide all students also, all Yorkville and TFS students with information, tips, and resources to help you be successful throughout your programs and beyond. Our expert will offer some brief thoughts on the topic of the day, and then we will take questions. I ask that you submit your questions using the Q&A uh, panel or option at the bottom of your screen, but I will be monitoring the chat as well. Uh, just as a reminder, November is Canada Career Month, and so this is a time when we uh, come together to highlight the importance of finding meaningful work and to celebrate those who work so hard to ensure Canadians are better prepared to develop and manage their careers in, emer in an emergent and sometimes chaotic labour market. And today's topic is very timely, the evolution of employability in a post-COVID economy. So I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome our speaker. Um, Amit Pradhan is a seasoned business Business leader with a background in engineering and an MBA from UBC. Um, Amit has over 13 years of experience in operations and supply chain leadership roles spanning across multiple countries and industries. His most recent roles include being the director of supply chain at Mountain Equipment Co-op. I had no idea of that about you until I read your bio. And uh, he's currently senior regional leader at Amazon and supporting continuous improvement operations and new launches in Canada. And of course, He's one of our BBA instructors. So um, over to you. I'm going to mute myself, and uh, you are now in charge. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much, Dr. Pickerel. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak at this webinar. And I'd like to welcome uh, everyone on this webinar from whichever part of the world you're logging in virtually from today. So I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if it is visible. Is it good? Can you see yeah, my it, screen? It looks great. Do you see, the, do you yeah. see the slide deck? Perfect. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Awesome. So, okay, in this session today, I will be speaking about <clears throat> the reset uh, in progress, a reset that is uh, happening because of the COVID-19 pandemic that we are underway, uh, that, we, that is underway, um, and some expected changes in the future of work and how this actually may turn into a strategic reskilling opportunity for both businesses and job searchers alike. And what can potential job seekers, which I'm expecting some folks uh, in the audience today, maybe potential job seekers in the future, can take away from such tectonic shifts that is underway in the work environment. I reckon this is not enough time to get into a topic of such complexity, scope and impact. Uh, um, and I'm going to keep it pretty high level. And I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, at the end to the best of my knowledge after. Okay, so moving on. So 2020 has been a year to remember for all of us, even though some of us might want to just forget and dump it in the dustbins of history. This year has truly been unprecedented in so many different ways, uh, thanks to COVID-19 and the response behind it. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic will reverberate into the future change the future of work, make some key work trends irrelevant moving forward, while accelerate other trends that were already in motion. This is what many are calling as the reset, especially the World Economic Forum is calling it the Great Reset. So what is this reset? If we want to try, if we try to demystify it, as you can see on the screen, if we plot a graph of activity over time, the reset can be viewed as the three R combo of respond, recover, renew, or you may say it is the fourth R, the phase that comes after the renew phase that we are all in, which is rife with great potential and great peril at the same time. The reset is a paradigm shift in business model, in ways of work, in an organizational focus, in the workplace of the future. 
So what does the future of work look like? This is uh, something that I gathered from uh, Gartner research. And this is based on a survey of uh, around 800 uh, companies. So the research says the future looks like, as you might have observed already, is increasingly remote. It is very data hungry. It is uh, resilience focused as opposed to efficiency focused. It is mired in organizational complexity with new business models evolving, with new ways of work uh, uh, being on the horizon with humanization and in some cases, dehumanization of workers where organizations have recognized the humanitarian crisis of the pandemic by prioritizing the well-being of employees as people or employees or as workers. In other cases, organizations have also pushed employees to work in conditions that are high risk with little support. So these are examples of both humanization and dehumanization of workers happening at the same time. Um, and which is, so such mired, such work environment mired in complexity is also filled with disaggregation of roles from skills. As you can see here on the slide, separation of critical skills and critical roles is something that is being projected as the evolution of work, as the future of work in a post pandemic, post COVID-19 workplace. And with such disaggregation roles comes the opportunity for unbounded location of talent and most certainly increased reliance on technology. Now, when we are presented with such tectonic paradigm shifts, the, there emerges a gap in skill set to make the transition from the as is state that we are in, which really isn't anymore to the 2B state that we are all progressing towards. Now, this gap is also presenting a strategic reskilling opportunity for both businesses and job searchers alike. This is what we call a hard fork at the road. There's a schism, a hard fork at the road. The downtime from remote working or from lockdowns can be repurposed by both businesses and job searchers alike towards reskilling, towards the reset, reskill, and rebound back, because we know most certainly that there is going to be an upturn once the effect of pandemic subsides. But if we do not cater to the needs of the fork of the road, if we go in an idling mode, then the skill crisis will resume and it will amplify with time and it will render both businesses and employees obsolete and invalid because of lack of upgradation of skills. Now folks, I just wanted to say that I understand some of the content in this slide is pretty heavy. It needs way more discussion than what I'm able to offer with the time limit that I have. If at any point in time you would like to like me to go back to any particular slide, you'd like me to um, uh, elaborate on any of the points that I'm, I'm, I'm quickly touching upon, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, but for now, I'll be moving on with the presentation. So, as I said, this, this pandemic, this hard fork in the road is compelling us to reskill ourselves. It's compelling us to revisit our skill set and, and improve it and, and upgrade it to what would be necessary in the workplace of the future. What would be those skills that would be necessary in the workplace of the future? I do have one slide on that at the end. We can have a discussion on that. What I'm trying to highlight for lack of time, I'm just going to highlight one thing here is a technique for reskilling, which is what we are calling as micro learning in the industry. Well, I'm sure there are lots of students in the audience today and uh, we are all right now engaged in what we can say, um, the opposite of micro learning or mega learning with three hour sessions and 11 weeks uh, for a course. Uh, but here are some tips that I can offer you, uh, which is out of syllabus. Yes, pretty, yet pretty relevant to put on your radar. As you can see, uh, Udacity is offering free tech training for laid off workers. There are hundreds of courses in Coursera that are being offered online for free. Um, from an organizational standpoint, from an employer's vantage point, Amazon is pledging to upskill 100,000 employees in, in, for in-demand jobs by 2025. 
There's plural side. There's another uh, forum for uh, online learning or micro learning that is um, providing or encouraging uh, uh, folks to be upskilling themselves by providing free courses. So I'm not saying that the content that we are going through in class, the, the course outcome is irrelevant yet. It, it, there's, it's still a relevance. It's still a relevance for the audience that we are teaching, but that will not be enough moving forward. So there needs to be certain ownership on part of job seekers. I'm reckoning uh, quite a bit of you, quite, quite many of you will be out there in the market looking for jobs uh, in the near future. So just a bachelor's degree, let's say in supply chain in energy management might not be enough might not be enough and there might be need for skill set outside of what is being offered in the classrooms and these are some uh, opportunities that you can avail to upskill yourself now let's go back so what what would you need micro, uh, micro learning for right what what are the kind of skill set that is lacking or that would be in higher demand in the workplace of the future. So based on my personal internet research, based on my attendance in, um, in uh, online sessions from industry leading uh, analysts and experts like Gartner, IBM, and Amazon internal tech sessions. Um, and also based on my understanding of how work is evolving and how my teams, how my deliverables on a day-to-day -day basis are evolving, uh, I would say the high demand skills in future work would be agile methods of working. And I, as I said, I would probably not have enough time to go into each of these uh, topics because they are a universe in itself, uh, but look them up, Google them up if you want. I can, I would share my slide deck with you. Um, see how you can position yourself from where you are right now with the skill sets that you are uh, building on uh, in your BBA course to how you can um, gain more mastery through micro learning, through other methods of learning into these high demand skill sets of future, like agile methods of working, uh, design thinking, robotic process automation, remote service delivery, and uh, product management, management disciplines. Uh, some of you might raise a question that in one of the slides earlier, I have mentioned that there will be increased reliance on technology in the evolution of work slide, I mentioned that. So why am I not mentioning any skill set with regards to technology or uh, digital dexterity um, as, uh, as a necessary skill set for the future? Well, I would like to differentiate between digital dexterity and uh, core tech skills uh, here. So in rethinking convention, I would say core tech skills criticality will decline. And this may come as a surprise to quite a few of you on this uh, webinar. But again, this is based on research. This is based on trend analysis from the past. What we are seeing is as technology advances, employees can take on technically focused tasks even without expertise. I'm going to give an example from my, uh, from my personal uh, 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 interface at work. So as a senior program manager at Amazon, I am required to be uh, working very close with databases. I'm required to run my own data queries and generate my own reports. Uh, we do not have the luxury of hiring data analysts for every, every little role. So what that means is as a non-technical program manager, I still need to be able to run my own codes, run my own um, uh, database uh, queries. But what I've seen is an evolution in that tech aspect of work. Today, I can run a code which would be as complex as a, 2000 lines of uh, data analysis query by just clicking on certain user interfaces that I call grasshopper. So that the grasshopper makes the user interface more human friendly so that I do not have to communicate with the computer in machine in the machine language. So that is the future of tech. The future of tech is not tech agnostic. The future of work is not tech agnostic. The future work is more tech friendly, meaning you do not have to be speaking to the computer in machine language. You can just be calling off functions that has already been designed and you should have the logical mindset to be able to understand what kind of questions to ask and what kind of logical answers should solve the question that is being asked. So in the future, there will still be certain jobs and technical skills that will be true competitive differentiators for the organization 
but they will likely be in pockets of the organization rather than across the broader workforce because the interface, the human tech interface will be made more and more simpler with, uh, with passing time. So what does it mean? That means you need to have a logical mind flow. You need to have design thinking. You need to understand agile methods of working. You may not necessarily need to be a master in SQL or Ruby on Rails or Java coding. That might be uh, reserved for uh, the very core tech, uh, tech leaders. So I understand I'm right on time, uh, Dr. Pickerel. Is that true? So I'm going to stop here. I understand there's a lot of food for thought that I've thrown at the audience. So I'll give it a few minutes for the folks to like come up with any questions if you have for me or if you want to revisit any of the slides and elaborate on any of the points that I've just covered. Yeah, no, that was uh, that was great. Thank you very much. One of the things that um, um, really stood out for me, well, two things that really stood out for me as we're just waiting for for any you know people to to post their questions is the increase in in where we, where you suspect um, remote work will will go. You know that it that there's been this increase overall and that that will stay. That was almost at half that half of the workforce um, could potentially be working remotely. Um, and so that's an, that's, that's quite a large increase. And um, I think probably has some, um, some benefits and, and some challenges depending on, on the individual person and the individual organization. I know some people are managing to work remotely quite well and for others, uh, it can be quite isolating. So that's, that's an interesting trend that you've, that you've shared with us today. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting was, and, and really timely for our students as they, as they go to look for work, was um, the question, how did you treat your workforce during the pandemic? What a fascinating question to ask um, an interviewer in the, um, you know, in the interview uh, is, and to get a sense. That, that is a very good way to assess the culture of the organization is how they treated their workforce. Conversely, um, on the organization side, we're seeing that question come to um, interviewees. What did you do during the, the, the pandemic? Like, what was your approach during the pandemic? If you weren't working during the pandemic, what did you do? So, you know, we're all of a sudden seeing this whole um, pocket of questions on both the employer and the candidate side really related to how they've managed and what their approach has been, um, you know, throughout the, the pandemic. And I, I would suspect that, that, that that's going to continue. Would, would you agree that like well into the future, that's going to be something that we can potentially use to, to get a sense of, of, of who we're talking about when we're, we're looking for workers and vice versa? I think that's that's a great point, and I, I, I agree with you. Yes, that's a trend that we can uh, project is going to continue in the future, um, for for different reasons. First of all, uh, we do not know if this pandemic has an expiry date. We don't know when every, right. when the new normal uh, is going to blur in with the old normal, or or if there is an opportunity that the old normal is going to come back at all. Uh, that's one. Second. Uh, the expectations are going to be reset the way, as you said, the, the questions that has been that has been asked is how did you treat your employees during the workforce? Or if the employers ask similar questions, how did you upskill yourself during the downtime that was uh, that was offered? Uh, it goes both ways. So the expectation is being recalibrated. The expectation is being reset on both sides. And often what right. we see is with just change in situation, those expectations don't just go away. They, they remain and they become a part of, they become more ingrained up as a part of the culture of the organization or a strategy of the job seekers. So these kind of changes, some of the changes that we see may not be reversible, may be here to stay for the long haul. Right, right. The other thing that I, I thought was interesting was your comment. It's in, thank you for changing back to the slide, by the way, because that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about here is, um, that contingent worker expansion, you know, within the career development sector, there's lots of conversation going on around the gig worker population and, and whether this is considered, you know, kind of really viable work for somebody to build a career on or whether it's considered quite precarious work. Um, you know, and obviously some data show support one belief and some data shows, you know, supports the other belief, but it's, um, it, it's interesting here that you've got that, that, uh, you know what? What you're looking at from a from a post-COVID economy is that 
um, employers might seek to expand this gig worker population to, um, you know, it, whatever that might look like, but there might be more opportunity for good for gig work, whether you consider that a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, de definitely, yes, the opportunity for gig work opportunity for, um, as we say, multiple sources of income might go up with uh, uh, you not being treated as full time 40 hour employee as in one organization as such. And your time being able to be rationed across multiple different projects in multiple different companies at the same time. So if, you, if you're referring right. to that as increase in gig, I'd say, yeah, definitely that is going to go up. Uh, and one impetus to that would also be um, the lack of need to be physically present to deliver your services. So as I right. mentioned in, in, the, in the increase of, in the, in the skill set of the future, remote delivery, so remote service delivery is going to be something uh, that will become more and more uh, important, more and more critical. And for anyone, whether it be a consultant or whether it be a senior uh, leadership coach, um, if they're able to be servicing multiple clients at the same time without having the need to be on premise, uh, remote service delivery would be something that they need to be adding to their arsenal of, uh, of services as well. For, for sure, for sure, that's great, thanks. Okay, so we have a question that comes in. So do you think that this means that employers are, so I think this kind of comes back to the, the, the comment that I made about, you know, in the, you know, during the interview. So do you think that this means employers and candidates will start evaluating each other as people more than as team members in, um, or empl and employers? It's a great question. Um, well, as I identified in, uh, in this slide, so there is both the possibility of humanization of workforce and dehumanization of workforce. Now, the fact that there is going to be less physical contact, there is going to be um, uh, less being in the presence of your team, being in the presence of your uh, of the of folks in the organization, going out for a team lunches, team dinners, uh, that experience will be suffered, that there will be a decrease in that experience for sure. There will be an increase in more transactions using technology. So that is for certain, right. there will be more Zoom calls, there will be more um, forums coming up where you can collaborate, where, it, where work becomes easier. The challenge for the, for the leaders of future HR will be how we can use this opportunity and still not lose sight on humanization of the workforce. So back to the question, I think personally, there's an increased risk of dehumanization here, given the physical, the, the commonly accepted human aspects or humane ways of working will be lacking. We are going to be moving into a more uh, yeah. tech-based, tech platform-based uh, working model, regardless of whether our roles are tech-based or non-tech-based. Even office administration work will, will migrate to uh, tech platforms. Even um, uh, coordination jobs will move, move to tech platforms. Um, which would generally be more very in-person, uh, very connection-based roles. So that is definitely going to bring about a reduction in uh, the human contact, the human human need for connection. How we circumvent that and still maintain that uh, that organic relationship within working teams is going to be a challenge for the future of HR. Right. Yes, I think it's a challenge we're all experiencing right now. <laughs> exactly. um, so a question has come in for another question has come in. What ideas can you share for um, to help improve our technical skills and where do we find this information? So that's a broad question in itself because uh, <laughs> tech in itself means different things to different people. Like if you are in the yeah, IT sure. industry, tech uh, means uh, how comfortable you are at using computers or having the computers answer the questions that you need to ask. If you are in, um, not in the high tech industry, tech might mean something else, be it in like uh, tech related to logistics, tech related to supply chain, tech related to engineering, um, stuff like that. So for purpose of discussion, let's say the question around, question here is around um, digital dexterity or tech with regards to uh, the digital transformation that is already ongoing in the workplace of the future. So uh, as, I, as I identified in my final slide, more important than 
So the tech skill more important than learning how to be a coder in C, C++, Java, Ruby on Rails, how to be running your own SQL queries, how to be uh, running your uh, own OLAP queries. More important than that is understanding the logic behind the technology. Because I said, the technology of the past, the way we have used to been working in the past is um, not very user friendly in the way we connect with computers. We still use machine learning when we are asking questions to computers. That is going to shift. In the personal anecdote that I shared, instead of running SQL queries, when I had to like type thousand lines of code using inner join, outer join us in a specific uh, syntax, what I can do now is I can just open up a user interface. I can click on, on certain buttons and I can ask the computer to logically rearrange the button so that a certain answer can come out of it. So more important than understanding the syntax of programming languages is to understand what kind of tech is suitable in which situation and what is the inherent logical flow in that technology that is going to make us uh, more successful in the workplace of the future. And that is something that we can learn from design uh, thinking methodologies from um, agile methods of software development. These are uh, some pointers that you may want to look into. Um, and uh, if you want to get really specific on um, the hardcore tech, I would say Splunk and Hadoop in big data is something that is uh, making some commotion out there. That is something you may want to look into as well. Right. If I may, I, you know, I would also tend to add that, you know, e even some of our most basic, um, you know, kind of interfaces that we, we now are all used to using, whether it's email or Word or Excel or Outlook, you know, all of these, all of these things that we have all become very reliant on. Studies continue to show that we underutilize these, that we don't use them as effectively as we could do, whether it's, you know, the task list or using Microsoft Teams or Planner or, you know, um, you know, any of the, the task management apps and stuff like that. So, you know, I would hope that in addition to all of the things that you're talking about, that people recognize that, you know, so much of the technology that we're using today, just, just for our regular communication, we actually don't use as well as we think. And we, we don't use them, like they're very powerful programs that we, we don't use to their fullest. And so if we can even raise our, our, our ability to use the technology that we're very used to using and very comfortable using more effectively, that, that will probably make things easier. I've got one last question for you. If, um, um, if, if we've got time. So uh, this is an interesting one. What solutions are possible for the segment of the workforce that are being dehumanized during this pandemic? So for example, being expected to work in unsafe conditions, like, like what tips or strategies can you offer perhaps both, you know, from the business side, but also from the individual side, you know, around, you know, to, you know, for solutions for this part of the population that it, that it truly is being dehumanized at this point. I mean, I can share what I'm seeing in, um, in, in companies like um, MEC, what I've seen in companies like MEC and Amazon. At Amazon, uh, if we can say that there was, a, there was a chance of dehumanization of the workforce in the fulfillment centers, Amazon introduced 1,500 process changes. They call them PCNs, process change notifications. Wow. So from COVID to post-COVID, there were 1,500 process changes introduced just to make the work, the work environment more resilient and more safe and so that wor workers can feel comfortable showing up at work every day. That involved right. Uh, right. distribution of masks, that involved um, sanitization, that involved uh, social distancing audits, that involved building a team uh, that uh, looks into the technology that can help enforce uh, government guidelines. To give an example, in Amazon, it may sound like a dystopian future from some of the Hollywood movies that we have seen in, in the past. So in Amazon, the moment you work into one of the fulfillment centers, there are, there are cameras that is going to be tracking you. And if you come within six feet or the recommended uh, social distancing norms at that point in time, uh, there is going to be alarm that's going to be triggered somewhere in India and the team is going to reach out to that uh, to that individual site and mention that there is um, potential risk of transmission and actions need to be taken. At this wow. point, still focused on privacy, like faces are still blurred and 
Uh, you can only determine where something happened at what time it happened and it, how many people it involved. So they're still calling it uh, on the basis of metadata. Like you cannot figure out who was involved, but where was, did this happen and um, how many people are, are at risk of transmission. So as dystopian as it right. may sound, this is also uh, generating the required level of confidence for folks to show up, understanding that there are policies in place to prevent the dehumanization and to um, make sure that we are not just going back into the habits of the past where there was not a raging pandemic. Right, right. Yeah, it's, I think it's like anything. Technology can be used as a learning tool in it. For, like to me, that can become a, a, a you know teachable moment. You know, we had these experiences. Everybody needs to remember. It's when it becomes more punitive that you know potentially you know we could have you know lots of people talking about the ethics of it all and, and all that sort of stuff. So sometimes it's not the technology in itself. It's how it's actually you know how businesses choose to um, use it either as a teaching tool or as a punitive. Punitive tool. So that's this has been fa absolutely fascinating. We've we've run out of time, but this has been a fascinating uh, talk today. I'm so glad that we um, managed to get you here, and I really appreciate. I know we we pushed your talk. Nobody, of course, knows that, but we really wanted your talk to be in Canada Career Month. So you were actually scheduled months ago. But so I really appreciate you being flexible um, with your time, and thank you so much. Uh, remember, everybody, that this was live stream. So if you want access to the slide deck, all you have to do is go to YouTube find the Yorkville University channel and it will be there momentarily. And then you can pause and you can listen to us to your heart's content. Um, so again, thank you so very much for, for coming. We, um, we're done Ask an Expert for today. Uh, next week, for those of you that are regularly tune in is a little bit of a change because I am in the hot seat. Um, my talk next week is going to be building your career your way, um, where a key takeaway that I hope all of our listeners will um, will leave with is to is embracing the notion that every decision that you make is actually a career decision. So I look forward to seeing everybody next week. Um, having a fantastic rest of your day, a terrific weekend. And I'm at, again, once again, thank you so much for being here. Thank Bye, everyone. <laughs>